So remember this time last month when I said that I was going to read 10 books for both novellas in November and nonfiction November combined. And if I got through them with enough time, I was going to add a couple books at the end. So I wanted to read ideally 12 books in November. Well, I read five, mostly because in the second half of November, the depression really started to kind of settle in to my life. Um, and it's been really difficult reading through that. I literally haven't read a word in the last two plus weeks. But on the positive side, to try to keep this positive, uh, or as positive as possible, the first half of the month, some really good things happened. One of the greatest graphic novels that I've read in my whole life, and then one of the best pieces of Canadian literary fiction that I've read in a really long time. And it is so weird and unusual, and I don't think you're gonna wanna miss hearing about it because, yeah, it's okay, it's bear. It's the one with the bear sex. Okay, let's just get that out of the way. There's bear sex in it. It's super weird, but it's a bizarrely phenomenal novel, and I'm excited to talk about it. But before we get to that, I want to talk about two novellas that I read and then one short nonfiction book, all of which were good, none of which were great. The first one I want to talk about is Einstein's Dream by Alan Lightman. This was a 3.5 out of 5, so a pretty decent book. And what it is, is a fictional retelling of dreams that Einstein was having on the way to his big breakthrough. So it's told in these small little vignettes, really, each one presents a different kind of fictionalized reality of one of his theories of time. So it's like, what if time moved more slowly the further away from the ground you got? So then it creates this kind of classist, elitist system where the wealthiest, most important people would, would live higher off the earth. What if time moved in fits and starts? What if it it literally moved faster sometimes and moved slower at other times. Or you know how you've heard time flies when you're having fun? What if time literally moved faster while you're having fun? It's funny at times, but it's actually like intriguingly serious most of the time. I found it like quite creatively stimulating personally, but I know it won't be for everybody, but I would, uh, yeah, I would definitely recommend it. The next book that I wanna talk about very briefly is Animal Farm by George Orwell. The only reason I'm gonna talk about this briefly is that I wanna combine a true review of this book with 1984 from George Orwell that I read uh, last year. Both of these books are for my top 125 books of all time project, so I wanna do them justice with a full on good review, but all I'll say about the book now is that I was like a little underwhelmed by it. I think it's because I was kind of constantly comparing it with 1984 as I was reading it. I read 1984 at the tail end of last year and that book just blew me away. So in terms of Orwell books that had set the bar so high for this book and I don't think it even came close to clearing it. This book isn't nearly as good as 1984 is, but that doesn't mean that it's not a good book. Taking the book on its own, the one big criticism I had of it, and because I, I, I won't talk about all the good things, I'll leave that for the, the proper review, all the good things that it's doing, but the one thing that I was disappointed in is that I think I kind of got it like 10, 15 pages in. I'm like, okay, I know what you're trying to do here, I get the metaphor, I get the symbolism, and yet the book went on for another 100 pages or whatever it was. And I just feel like the point of that book is that it's supposed to surprise you how things turn out, that the animals end up forming a civilization that works very much like our own. And it just like, that was just so clear early on that that was where he was going to go, that uh, the, the, the journey he was trying to take me on, I feel like it didn't land quite the way that Orwell wanted it to land. The last book I wanna talk about really quickly is Peace and Good Order by Harold Johnson. This is a book that talks about the plight of indigenous people in Canada and how the justice system has failed them again and again and again, how and why this is happening. But when it comes to reviewing a book like this, I realize there's kind of two ways to approach it. On one side, you have the messaging, you have the content, you have the ideology, and if you look at it that way, this is a five-star book. This is a really, really important book talking about things that not enough Canadians know enough about. I think this is important stuff that more people need to be in the know about, so if you look at the book in terms of just presenting information, this is kind of like a five-star read for people. However, reviewing this book as a book 
looking at the presentation and how well or not well Harold Johnson presented this material, I have serious gripes with it. Most notably Johnson's seeming inability to provide sources or evidence for a lot of the claims that he thinks or seems to think are self-evident. But seeing as he wrote this book to convince people that certain things are going on, if he's trying to convince people that these things are happening, for those people, these things won't seem self-evident. So he has to do a better job at providing context, at looking at the data. And he fails to do this almost all the time. He just constantly makes statements without backing it up with statistics. So he's just kind of making a claim that should seem analytical, but it comes off very anecdotal. And I think that's the huge problem with the book. I don't think he has enough context or data to really convince anybody this is what's happening if they're not already convinced that this is what's happening. Now, I think it's important to point out that I'm not saying that I think he's making these things up. Um, I took him on good faith as I read the book and that's why I enjoyed it as much as I did. But I just think his points could hold up to scrutiny better if he provided more data and more context. All right, with those three out of the way, I wanna to get to the meat of this video. Two books that I really, really wanna talk about because uh, they were both really, really good in very, very different ways. The first of which is Bear by Marion Engel and the second of which is Fun Home by Alison Bechtel. The first, let's get to Bear because, you know, any book with bear sex is gonna be the showstopper. Okay, I feel like at this point I should provide more context for why I'm reading this book and what this book actually is because it sounds insane if you've never heard me talk about this book before. Okay, um, Bear by Marion Engel is a true like literary classic in Canada. It came out in 1976 and it is about a woman who goes uh, off kind of into the country, into the woods to live in this small homestead to study this man who lived there and all the writings that he left there uh, to compile a report on it for this like pseudo governmental agency that she works for. So she spends a couple of months living in this cabin on this small island in Northern Ontario, kind of reading all about his life. And kind of attached to this homestead is this pet bear that lives there. There's kind of a long history of bears living attached to this homestead. So he's the latest one and he's got kind of a small cave that he lives in off to the side of the house. He's actually chained up and the person who's living there at the time goes out and gives him food and kind of takes care of him. And he's very docile. He's, he's pretty much like a pet. So Lou, who is our protagonist, she is a 27 year old going through kind of a quarter life crisis as she undertakes this job uh, at the start of the book. And I was very much surprised to find out that the book is really about this woman going through this time in her life. And it's really not about the bear per se. Look, there, like a couple of years ago, this book was reprinted and I think it was on Tumblr or Imager or one of these places. And a bunch of like excerpts from the book have been sh started getting shared like millions and millions of times as people were kind of becoming familiar with this book for the first time. So it got all this weird online press for being just the weirdest freakiest, most bizarre book ever. And people are like, what the fuck is going on in Canada? Is this a thing? But what people couldn't tell from these passages was just how insightful and how funny and how brilliant this book actually is. Essentially, the bear goes down on her a couple of times. There's zero penetration. And I was afraid that the bear was going to be like the aggressor and he's actually like physically mounting her. And there's like this weird danger aspect to it. And just like, you know, physically how it works and all that stuff. Like I was nervous that that was where it's going to go. But it's like always extremely tender and it's subtle and it's not ever meant to be gross. It's actually like, bizarrely comic a lot of the time. It's never meant to really be sexy. It is this expression of 
tenderness and safety that the bear brings to her. It's it, it's their their relationship, not like a sexual relationship. The, like the actual relationship she has with the bear um, is very sweet and very centering to her. And before, like this may make it sound even weirder, but like before it happens, it feels like someone who's really lonely but gets a dog, and that dog brings all these things out in her. Uh, but eventually, it it just goes weird. But um, but she makes a point in the book about talking about how weird it is. The bear is actually way less into it than she is. The bear is kind of just doing it to provide her some comfort. It almost feels like um, whenever it, 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 she even thinks of taking it further, the bear literally like walks away. He scratches her on the back at one point. Like the bear is not interested in in consummating this relationship in any kind of serious way. So. It's a book that brings up a ton of questions. The biggest one of which is like, why the fuck am I liking this book as much as I am? There's this like anticipation to the book that you just can't manufacture in any other way. Like you just know something weird is about to go down and you're just kind of waiting for it. You're like, how does Angle get there? How does she approach this? How does Lou feel about this? What is the bear like? What happens? Do they... Does she live with this bear? Does it, how gross does it get? Is it gross? Is it interesting? Is she using this as a metaphor? Is it real? And you'll put the book down because it's very short. It's like 115 pages or something. And you'll put the book down and you'll just be shocked at how much you enjoyed it. But I will say the one caveat to this is I think this is just like a quintessentially can lit novel. And I think this book will be more enjoyed by people who are familiar with Canlit, because I think Engel was writing a bit of a commentary on Canlit as a form. What is allowed, what isn't allowed. She actually says in the book that the quote, Canadian tradition was, she had found on the whole, genteel. So I think she's very purposely pushing back at the kind of unspoken boundaries of Canlit, of Canadian literature. What can you do? What can't you do? Canada especially is this, yeah, it's this very gentle, quiet literary scene that's very much about unassuming people in unassuming places. It's about tradition. It's about landscapes. And she just drops Bear in the middle of that. And she's like, what are you going to do with this? And in part for its just bizarre strangeness for its ability to just get inside that stuffy tradition of, of Canadian literature... I think the book deserves to be celebrated or at least read and interpreted and considered and taken seriously. Because most interestingly, I think it picks apart those Canadian traditions while at the same time very much evoking them. Like this feels like such a quintessential Canadian novel when you read it. It feels, it feels so canlit to me. Okay, enough with me making you feel really uncomfortable. Let's talk about a book that I think more people will be interested in the graphic novel Fun Home by Alison Bechtel, which while it probably wasn't the most enjoyable graphic novel I've ever read, it's probably the best graphic novel that I've ever read. This is a graphic memoir that is a little bit about Alison Bechtel's journey of growing up and realizing she's a lesbian, but it is a lot about the story of her father who died when Alison was very young in her early 20s. Um, it might have been suicide, it might not have been suicide. But it's about her learning at the end of his life that her father was actually at least bisexual, but possibly even gay. And she didn't know the entire time. What I love most about Fun Home, though, is it's just chock full of literary references. I think I counted 70 or 72 allusions to, you know, other pieces of literature in the story. So on one hand, there's the fun of finding all these things and then just kind of doing your own research into them and why she's using them. But there's also the very important reason she's telling her story with so many literary references. In the book, she says, I employ these illusions not only as descriptive devices, but because my parents are most real to me in fictional terms. And perhaps my cool aesthetic distance itself does more to convey the Arctic climate of our family than any particular 
literary comparison. So for Alison Bechtel, fiction is just such a huge part of her life. Fiction was really the best translator for her, the best way for her to actually come to terms and understand the things that were happening to her. And I just found that concept so interesting that she's writing an autobiography or a memoir, but it's a memoir that could not have been made possible without so many references to works of fiction. And I really need to just point out one specifically uh, because the book ends with like this 20 to 25 page meditation on her trying to understand her father through the lens of both the myth of Icarus and James Joyce's Ulysses. And it is phenomenal. There's nothing else I've ever read that has made me want to read Ulysses specifically but as soon as I finished this book, I started researching Ulysses and figuring out a way that I could read it in 2021 because she speaks of it in such an interesting way. Like to me, that, that sounds like one of the most boring books that's ever been written. And in Alison Bechtel's hands, it sounded so interesting and crucial and specific to my life somehow. They were 20 to 25 of the most impressive pages from any book I've ever read, graphic novel or otherwise. It was unbelievable. But what Bechtel is doing is, is going much further than kind of pointing out things that like, if you felt what I'm feeling, you might understand it better in this. If you, uh, you know, love literary references, here's like a bunch just to make the book feel, feel really fun and you can kind of find them all as you're reading. She's doing so much more than that because I think what she's doing is really pushing at the boundaries of what kind of the nonfiction genre can be. I wasn't even realizing what was happening until I read a review of the book um, that Lidhub had done after I'd finished it. And they had described it as a nonfiction story translated into the sequential art of a comic book, and yet it reads like a literary novel. It's just brilliant and it's one of the only graphic novels I think I've ever read where I'm positive that it will get better every single time you read it. It was the most fun, it's so beautiful. My heart just goes out to her late father who lived this incredibly private but thoughtful and searching lifestyle. And um, it sounds like he's a person who went way too fast but you know, in the end, he's kind of survived in the pages of these books. And he's he's a fascinating character. He seemed like a beautiful person uh, who was kind of vastly misunderstood to pretty much everyone in his life, including his wife. But I think Fun Home, if it does anything, it makes you understand her father uh, as much as anything else ever had in his life. So I think that's really beautiful. So that was both nonfiction November and novellas in November. For me, it was ultimately satisfying because I read a couple of things that I will take with me for a really long time. Numbers wise, it was a tragedy, but you know, what are you gonna do? It's like I said, it's 2020 and it just kicks you in the ass sometimes. And um, yeah, I've been having a really hard time for the last couple of weeks, but I'm kind of sorting it out. I'm a big fresh start person when it comes to reading. Like I love the start of every month because it just feels like you get this second chance to start again and kind of wipe the slate clean. And, and the start of every year is a big time for me. Like January 1st is a huge reading moment for me. I love planning out my reading. I love being able to turn the page and kind of just be optimistic about the reading year that's ahead of you. But I think I'm getting the jump on it uh, a month early because I'm just, I woke up today just really excited that it was December 1st and I get to start a new month and I have a really great month of reading planned. Planned, we'll see if I get to it, we'll see how the reading goes. But with that, I'll let you go. Please let me know how your November went, how your reading went, what you're looking forward to reading in December. If you're really excited about turning the page on 2020 and uh, and what kind of books you're looking forward to in 2021. I'm excited to talk about all of it. So uh, yeah, keep it going down in the comments and I will see you guys again with a video in a couple days. Bye.